Welcome to the Elevate Podcast, conversations with women changing the face of business. And now your hosts, Christy Wallace and Maricela Herrera. Hello and welcome to the Elevate Podcast. This is your host, Christy Wallace, with my co-host, Maricela Herrera. Maricela, how is it going? Hey, Christy. I'm okay. I'm surviving. I uh, was getting a migraine earlier today, but I'm better now. So, well, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. So Marisela, as you know, we are now in October, which I think for both of us is some mixed feelings. Uh, mm-hmm. We both love the summer and we love the beach. But I'm excited for October because it's National Work and Family Month. And as a caregiver myself, uh, having a month that's celebrating working caregivers, of which 48 million in the United States, is uh, pretty spectacular. It's uh, interesting. It coincides with the start of school and Q4 and all of these other things that I'm personally juggling. But I uh, was really excited for this conversation that our listeners are going to hear next with AARP Family Caregiving, uh, where we're really talking about the role of caregivers in our society and the ability we have to impact policies that that will create more support for the working caregivers amongst us. You know, it's great that there's a recognized month for for this, but reality is like it should be recognized all the time. Uh especially I think this year we've we've learned I'm I'm not a caregiver. Uh I I live on my own, but I see you all who who are you know, taking care of your families and not just kids, but also parents or other family members who might need you. And I'm so impressed with how this year has shown how resilient and important this conversation is. It really is. I I completely agree. And thank you for saying that. You know, I know it's hard uh, for many of us, but it's also is rewarding. And a big part of what what I've come to appreciate always, but especially during this time, is the support of my colleagues and coworkers. It's like we're all in this together, and it feels like we um, are navigating many uncertain times. Uh, but when you feel supported, when you see, feel seen and heard, it, it means a lot. And so thank you, Maricela, for your support mm-hmm. always. Uh, and For those who are looking for more resources and support, AARP has uh, some great, great things that I wanted to mention. If you go to aarp.org forward slash election 2020, there's a nonpartisan voter guide, which is important as we head into the elections and understanding how to use your voice and your vote uh, towards the policies that matter to you and to all caregivers. And also aarp.org forward slash caregiving. Is a great resource for how to support caregivers in your life, in your workplace, and beyond. So I encourage all of you to check it out. And now let's get to my interview. Nancy, thank you for joining us here today for this very important conversation. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I appreciate Elevate's not only interest, but leadership on this issue, because it's going to take a lot of people to push ahead and to provide the kinds of uh, supports we need for family caregivers. You and I were just talking a moment ago, and I know we both come to this uh, topic uh, with great personal interest and great personal investment. And I think that's so important as each of us advocates on these, not only on Capitol Hill, but across the country. Oh, absolutely. Nancy, I would love it if you could start this conversation off uh, painting a picture of who we mean when we say caregiver and who is a working family caregiver. Sure. Well, uh, pre-COVID, we know there were 48 million Americans caring for an aging parent, spouse, or another loved one. And the picture is about 61% were in the paid workforce, either full or part-time. 67% are women. 
almost half are under the age of 50, and remarkably and little known, about 25% of them are millennials, and 10% are over the age of 80. 40% of family caregivers are people of color, and the average length of time for caregiving is around 4.5 years. So uh, I often say that this is a job category. Family caregiver is a job category where there is no age discrimination. You can be any age and be a family caregiver. In addition to the length of service family caregivers have around 4.5 years, we also know that on average, family caregivers are spending about 24 hours each week with these responsibilities. And if you think of it, that's the equivalent of a part-time job. And we also know there's a financial cost to caregiving. We've done estimates, uh, AARP study put it at around 7,000 a year. But if you think of it, it's kind of a constant support. You're providing, uh, maybe you're bringing some groceries one day or you're running over to the drugstore another day. So we know there is a, um, a financial element to this. Um, Christy, you started by noting that we are in a uh, slightly different time now. I gave you stats for uh, pre-COVID, and what we know from a Genworth study is that within this COVID period, around one in three Americans say that they have become caregivers. You know, we used to joke at AARP that the numbers we thought were not as big as, as we knew them to be because nobody kind of knew they were a family caregiver. Well, thanks to COVID, uh, we have a situation where people do know if they're family caregivers. And, uh, you know, as you point out, we think that uh, one of the, I hate to even use the word benefit of this period we're in now, will be to shine a light on family caregivers, their needs, and hopefully um, uh, public policy will address it and employers will address uh, some of these needs as we move ahead. Yes, I'm, I'm very hopeful for that as well. You know, personally, as someone who has three little kids at home uh, and lost, you know, them being at school, which yeah. is, a, you know, form of that caregiving or our other child care support when we went into lockdown, um, it's, you know, become increasingly evident just the role that caregivers play, not just in our families, but in the workplace and right. how right. more to support that. So Nancy, as you reflect on these past couple months, and as we're navigating living, working, and caring for our loved ones during the pandemic and beyond, what do you see as the most pressing issues we need to address in our workplaces and our communities? Well, as you said, groups like AARP and yours have been working on these big responsibilities of caregivers for many years. And also, as you said in, in your opening remarks, um, a few years ago, this was an issue that was strictly personal. Uh, I remember um, my staff coming into my office and saying, you know, Nancy, I, gosh, I need to take a week off. My mom is not doing well. We're trying to figure out what to do and, and you know, treated it as a very kind of personal conversation. And ARP did a study about six or seven years ago and found that this deeply personal experience was something that was shared by, at that time, over 40 million people. And so we started to think about what kinds of policy measures could we start trying to put in place to help people. And we started with a pretty simple piece of legislation called, appropriately, the CARE Act. Um, and this was a, basically a provision in a bill that said that if, if your loved one goes into a hospital um, and is kind of checked in, uh, the hospital needs to record the name of the caregiver, and more importantly, when the person's discharged, both the individual and the caregiver are given instructions on what should be done afterwards, because you can imagine people leaving a hospital are not really focused on, on that. Well, when we raised the possibility of doing this, a lot of folks said, I don't, I don't know if you're going to make headway on this. Uh, you know, we're an advocacy organization, and, uh, you know, how do you get activists moving, and who's who has the least amount of time to be an advocate, a caregiver? Well, it turned out we started in Oklahoma, red state Oklahoma, and with the help of the governor, we passed the CARE Act, and now it's passed in 43 states. That, and we've continued with guardianship, power of attorney, other kinds of measures, both in the legislature and in the executive branch, 
uh, that have been able to help people in very practical ways. At the federal level, uh, we were joined with uh, Senator Collins and Senator Baldwin to push for the Ray's Family Caregiving Advisory Committee, which is now meeting with representatives from outside and also from government agencies, all with an eye toward what can be done to support caregivers. How can we look at current federal programs like Medicare and Medicaid, make them more responsive? How can we look to issues like um, tax credits, things like that, to, to help people? And as I often say, um, there, are around, there are around 3 million paid caregivers in this country. And there's no question uh, there are challenges for paid caregivers. We need more of them. Uh, we need to support them more. Uh, but there are 3 million of them and 48 million family caregivers. So my view is family caregivers are the newest provider group in the healthcare delivery system. And policy has to, has to adjust for that. Nancy, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for advocating on my behalf <laughs> and behalf of 48 million Americans, uh, because having this lens uh, uh, with which we're viewing policy and how we create change is, is so important. And I think that there's a lot of work that you're doing and will continue to do on this level. As and we're hoping, we're hoping that we can enlist uh, your, your members uh, to support us. I didn't mention, but you know, uh, there is a legislative agenda that we'll be putting forward. Um, uh, and that's to look at kind of caregiving tax credit, uh, paid family leave, how can we provide other kinds of resources? How can we enable people to stay in their homes? And you know, we've, we've shown a light recently on this nursing home crisis, which is uh, just unspeakably sad. Um, and the natural reaction is to say, well, people should be cared for in their homes, which of course is our goal, but that's also very hard. People need help doing that. I know that from personal experience. We, my family did it for, um, for six years when my husband was ill with ALS, and it was far better for him to be home, but it really requires a lot of effort. And what we all need to do is work on those kinds of supports so that people can stay in their homes. So I wanted to mention that in terms of what we'd be working on at the federal and the state level moving forward. Thank you, Nancy. And I couldn't agree more. I know I shared with you at the beginning of our conversation uh, that my 93-year-old grandmother just moved home with my parents, uh, and part of that was my, my dad retired, so he had the bandwidth to manage that. But we also know that my aunts and uncles who are working have less bandwidth and capability to, to support that situation, and so it is complicated. Uh, and the more that organizations like AARP are advocating for the credits and for the policies and the change that can support this infrastructure, uh -huh. uh, the more will make uh, for those 48 million Americans. I'm the CEO of a company uh, and I've worked for many big companies and, and yeah. there's a lot of conversation. You hit on this a little bit when you said, you know, years ago when your team would come to you about a family uh -huh. caregiving situation, but it's for a long time been a taboo. You don't uh -huh. mention that you are a caregiver, talk about your responsibilities, but we need to dispel that taboo. Uh, and, and I wanna know what can employers do? Uh, how, how do we best support the caregivers in our workforce? Well, as you know, employers are going to play a major role in helping family caregivers. We're going to try to work on policy solutions that support them, but where people work is where they spend most of their time, even if they're now spending most of their time at home at work. But um, but employers, I think, um, at the get-go, and you really hit on this um, uh, in your remarks, have to recognize that the world has changed. And, and I've spoken to a lot of employers over the last month or two. And as they look at, you know, there's a little cottage industry of, uh, of conferences you can go to now called What's the World Like Post-COVID? And I think as everybody looks at the world after COVID, we all recognize that a key part of this is how do we support our workers and that our workers will be more productive if we can enable them to uh, carry out their family responsibilities in an efficient way. And I think um, there are ranges of supports that employers can provide at a very basic level um, that's kind of free or low cost. Employers can provide information. They can provide 
uh, access to networks uh, in communities, which is where people really want to know what's available. And they can imp provide employee resource groups. And you know, when we first started our work on caregiving, we were very focused on major legislative initiatives. And I hadn't focused as much on kind of the day-to-day -day within AARP. And I do occasional kind of off the record around the table conversations with my staff. And I did three of them within a couple months. And at each one of them, the topic of the caregiving, um, somebody around the table was doing came up. And it was very clear that most people knew the services AARP offered, but everybody didn't. And um, it was important to be able to talk to other caregivers. And so that resulted in AARP creating an employee resource group. And again, that was not one of our first big initiatives, <laughs> but it was something that we recognized and has been very, very successful. And I said, as I said, kind of basic information providing the opportunity to exchange ideas is kind of a, a basic set of activities companies can do. The second is to look at workforce scheduling, flexibility. Uh, are people able to work different hours if they need to? Is it okay if the last minute you can't be at a meeting? Is that part of the culture? Uh, that that's a little harder for organizations to come to grips with, but I think they they will. And then also uh, the whole question of paid sick leave and paid family leave. And I do know that many employers who had not thought about it much before are now really, really looking at it. And I think everybody is seized of the fact that you certainly don't want somebody coming into work who's sneezing or coughing whether they're carrying um, a virus like COVID or whether they're carrying the common cold. So I think there are a whole range of benefits and employers are going to have to come to grips with it. I think uh, this period has emboldened workers in the sense that um, they know that business was able to adapt during the pandemic. And I think the logical extension of that is why can't we adapt moving forward? Yeah, and, and I wanted to highlight that AARP has done a, uh, a webinar with the Elevate community on how to create ERGs uh, to support working yeah. caregivers. Uh, so check out elevatenetwork.com for that recording. Uh, it's chock full of some great information and insights and, and action. Uh, yeah. I want to see this conversation lead to action on the personal level, um, policy, advocacy, workplace, and beyond. Nancy, I know that AARP, we've kind of talked about aspects of the platform and infrastructure you're working to create and develop in the, in the U.S. for working caregivers. So if you would just lay that out, big picture, across the spectrum, what are the things that AARP uh, is doing and how can we get more involved in that? Yeah, well, uh, as you pointed out, we're developing a lot of tools. We have uh, tools on how to create, as you said, the employee resource group, tools for healthcare organizations that are dealing with family caregivers uh, as somebody is actually getting medical care. Uh, we have tools available to help small businesses think about this because we know for small businesses, it can be a lot harder to balance everything um, uh, than it is for some bigger companies. And, and I, I've seen this myself, um, I oversee uh, all of our state offices, as well as some of our national stuff. And I have some state offices with five or six people. And when two of them are taking time to, with caregiving leave and other things, it's very, very hard. And uh, we have to be flexible on the part of our organization to do that. So we're going to have on the AARP.org site um, lots of um, materials and look forward to sharing them with you and hoping that you'll share them with your network so people can get the information they need. Um, uh, Bob Steven, who runs our caregiving program, uh, is always uh, reminding me that there are two areas where AARP can be especially effective. One is providing information on the kind of core things every caregiver needs to know. So power of attorney, how to man manage financial assets, how to understand Medicare, how to approach an insurance company. All of these are things that whether you're caring for somebody with ALS or Alzheimer's or anything, uh, you're going to need to know. 
The second area where AARP can be enormously helpful is helping people navigate. One level is how do you find out about resources at the local level? And then also, how do you find out resources from other groups? So, um, you know, you come to AARP, you have this general information, but again, if you're caring for somebody, usually you are, with a very specific disease, how do you connect with people that can talk more specifically about the challenges of caring for somebody with MS or diabetes or uh, epilepsy or a any number of things. So that, that's where we're trying to make headway. And we're also trying to help inform the kind of industry of high tech. Um, as all of you know, um, uh, the kind of technology community has viewed the, uh, 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 the aging population as a, um, an endearing market um, and a good market and are always looking for opportunities to provide uh, devices or help for people. And I think what's important, what we try to do is give them the sense of the real world. Um, and uh, I'll give you one example. My husband had, we had this little thing you put on his finger. I think everybody's seen it probably during COVID, you know, that, that just has a little battery in it and measures your oxygen level and your heart rate. Um, but a few months ago, somebody came to the house and said, oh, there's this great new technology. And it was this very complicated machine. And I couldn't figure out how to run it. And my son finally got it going. And basically, it measured your oxygen level and your heart rate. Um, and uh, so we try to talk to technology folks about kind of what are the needs, how to think about it, and then how to make it easy to use. So all of these are things we're working on, and of course would love to have uh, have help and support from uh, from all of you with advice and counsel. Yes, I love that. I mean, I would say as a small business leader, when I was trying to figure out our paid leave policies, I I didn't know where to go, uh, and I was doing tons of research and what are the best practices, and knowing that ARP has such great resources is is meaningful, not just as a leader to feel supported, but in terms of our workers and being able to create that gold standard and that mm -hmm. uh, that we all need. Uh, and yeah. then the health tech, I mean, it, we are at a time where, um, you know, it, it's ripe for innovation and it's exciting yeah. that you're leading those conversations. I, I want to bring this back to the election, which is coming up. And Nancy, you talked about some of the really powerful and impactful policies um, that that you AARP has really championed and, and led the way on it's in our community. So Elevate's community, women leaders in the workplace and beyond. Uh, we have such power right now to use our voice to create change to support the 48 million Americans who are caregivers, uh, to support ourselves. Um, what can we do, Nancy, as we look towards the ballot box um, to be advocates to be proactive and to, to really lead the way in this conversation? Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, AARP is very active during every election cycle. And as um, I think you all know, we are nonpartisan. We don't endorse candidates and we don't uh, give money. Um, but we do a lot of other things. And um, a lot of this is focused on women. ARP has 38 million members, about 60% of whom are women. Um, we are very attentive to all older Americans' interests in the course of um, in the course of the election cycle. But of course, um, there's a special place in our heart for the needs of women. Uh, you know, every election there's always a story about the gender gap. And a few years ago, it was all about the soccer moms, and then it was about the security moms. Uh, and uh, my prediction is that this election, people are going to kind of step back and say that it's what I call the worried women. And uh, if you look at all of the data, women over the age of 50 are very, very worried. They're worried about the economy. They're worried about health care. Um, and as you pointed out earlier, um, they are focused on their kids um, and they're focused on their parents, people of that age. So, um, so we think it's going to be very important to pay attention for us uh, to women in this cycle. Uh, since 1968, more women than men re have reported voting in presidential elections. And in every presidential election since 1980, 
women have turned out at a higher rate than men. And even as recently as 2016, close to two thirds of eligible women over the age of 18 voted compared to just under 60% of eligible men. So we know women have the power to decide elections. And we, of course, are very focused on older women uh, believing that they could be the deciders. Um, uh, we know they turn up uh, at the polls, although this time they may be turning up at a mailbox, um, but they, they do vote. And women over the age of 50, interestingly, we always say punch above their weight. They make up a larger share of the electorate than the proportion they are of the state's population. So for an example, in Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Florida, uh, women older voters account for about uh, a quarter of the population, but they account for a third of the actual voters. So uh, my advice is uh, keep your eye on uh, uh, women, older women voters in, in those places. So um, we are very focused on, on kind of uh, our constituency, this large number of people who are gonna vote. And then in terms of what we do, back to your, back to your original question, um, every election cycle AARP has a number of goals. The first is how do we press the candidates to talk about issues that are really important to our constituency? And that's typically social security, Medicare, healthcare, and because of our polling recently, we've also added caregiving. So how do we get candidates to address these issues? We press them in any way we can, we can dream up. Um, the second thing we do is once we have candidates, talking about the issues. We use all of our communication channels to be sure our members know what they said. And so we use our magazine, our bulletin, we have video voter guides, we have radio voter guides. All of this is designed to help inform our members who, by the way, are very interested in understanding the positions of candidates. Um, and then this year we've added a piece uh, which we call Vote Safely. And that is how do we provide information to our members about how they can exercise their right to vote in the most um, uh, healthy way possible for them based on their decisions. So we're working very hard in states on both absentee ballots and also ensuring that if you go to the polls, uh, there are gonna be people there with masks, you're gonna be socially distanced. And uh, we're, uh, we're really looking, looking forward to that. So. Uh, there's a lot to do, and uh, I, I can't remember the exact number of days, but it's uh, it's under 50 right now. It is. It is under 50, and I, just to echo what you're saying, Nancy, my, my sister-in-law is training a poll worker, so she has assured me things are, are safe, um, and yeah. there's calls in place, and we need more of us to kind of step up and um, take some of those roles, and I just finished filling out some voter registration cards with information on mail-in balloting. So I think across the board, uh, yeah. this conversation about taking action. Um, these are issues that, that matter a lot to me, uh, to you, Nancy, to AARP, your community and our community. And there's so many ways that we can uh, take action within the workplace, um, within the ballot box, within our communities to really uh, use our voice and yeah. to better support the 48 million working caregivers in the United States. Nancy, thank you so much for the work you're doing. Thank you. And thank you for, uh, for convening this forum. It's so important for groups, and I'm especially uh, taken with um, uh, women's groups, um, that to come together and talk about these kinds of issues. And, and as you said, to take action, even small actions. You know, we all can be overwhelmed by um, by having to do a lot, but uh, doing a little bit each day will help. And and I'm just delighted with our partnership. I hope we can continue to find ways to to work together. And uh, and I hope uh, you know I, I do an occasional email on what we're learning. Uh, from uh, about women voters in the course of this uh, this election cycle, I'd be happy to send it to to anyone who's listening. If uh, if uh, they just send me an email, nlamond at aarp.org, and uh, we'll put you on the list. Oh, excellent! I you expect an email from me right after. Uh, okay. Uh, now that's not the same as getting the feared letter when you turn fifty. Uh, <laughs> this is a different process. So. Uh, uh, I'm happy to just send this along to folks. 
I don't know. I just had a birthday, so I'm getting closer to that. That, and I'm excited for it. I, I can't wait. AARP is just a treasure trove of resources and support, a great community, um, but also doing a lot to advocate for yeah. Americans over 50, uh, really helping to create these conversations and policy. Nancy, for those that want to learn more, that want to get involved and stay engaged, where should they go? Well, um, uh, certainly the AARP website. You can go to aarp.org and find our information on caregiving. Um, and you can also go to aarp.org slash elections and find out what we're doing right now um, in the course of the, uh, uh, the campaign season. And as I said, if you're interested in this little email newsletter that we do, uh, it's not very fancy, uh, but uh, it always has really interesting information on what we're learning from the polls. Just feel free to shoot me a note. It's N Lamond, N-L-E-A-M-O-N-D at AARP.org. Great. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you to AARP Family Caregiving for being such a powerful and important voice in this conversation. Uh, thanks, Christine. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for listening to Elevate. If you like what you hear, help a girl out. Subscribe to the Elevate podcast on iTunes. Give us five stars and share your review. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Elevate NTWK. That's Elevate Network. And become a member. You can learn all about membership and all the great things that Elevate Network is doing at our website, www.elevatenetwork.com. That's E-L-L-E-V-A-T-E network.com. And special thanks to our producer, Catherine Heller. She rocks. And to our voiceover artist, Rachel Griesinger. Thanks so much and join us next week.